I'm Rick Perlstein. I'm the author of Nixon Land. The problem with Obama's uh, postpartisan agenda is that he came into it, he came into his presidency uh, at a time when millions of Americans, perhaps even tens of millions of Americans, don't consider a Democrat president legitimate, don't consider liberalism legitimate, don't consider uh, the idea of uh, the state forming new programs to help people legitimate. Uh, so he's in a situation a lot like uh, you know Abraham Lincoln faced in 1860 when you had millions of Americans who didn't even consider what was going on in Washington to have anything to do with them. So uh, the big question for me was always, was this postpartisan idea, this idea that you could kind of bring adversaries across the table and get them to agree to each other and agree with, to get them to agree with each other and uh, achieve social progress, was that a deep-seated belief of his? Or was that, in a certain sense, uh, a tactic? Not a cynical tactic, but a tactic. And uh, I would be very with him if it were a, a way of thinking about politics, if it were a tactic. Because the job of a transformative leader is not to hew to the center, but to define their own values as the center, as common sense. And uh, if he, you know, I, I believe in the agenda he's, he's, he's putting forward, for example, universal health care, you know, for example, uh, you know, cap and trade and green jobs as a way to, you know, solve our energy problems while growing the economy. I think these are reasonable, uh, while liberal, goals. And uh, if he presents them as reasonable and the reaction to them as one could knew they were going to be, because there are these millions of people who don't consider a liberal president legitimate, was irrational, extreme, that presented him an opportunity to say, my program is rational, but my opposition has chosen extremism, has chosen unreason, and be willing to take the hit that there's always going to be a minority of the country, 30%, 35%, even 40%, who disagrees with him radically, disagrees with him strongly. But if he's still willing to pass his program with that 60% margin, the rest of the country will eventually catch up. The reactionaries will understand, as they did with Social Security, as they did with you know, women getting the vote, freeing the slaves, you know, uh, social security, that actually these things were in their interests. They'll accept them as part of the established order of American society. And in fact, 20, 30, 40 down years, years down the road, the Republicans and the conservatives will be campaigning to save universal health care, just like they campaigned to save social security. But the problem is this doesn't really work unless you make this kind of tactical shift. If people say that you're illegitimate and uh, your liberal agenda is extremist, socialist, uh, destroying the America that we all grew up with, you have to be willing to say, this is unreasonable, this is extreme. And if you aren't able to say this is unreasonable and this is extreme, then you're granting your opposition uh, an undue uh, influence. You're basically uh, negotiating with the unnegotiable. And uh, as Abraham Lincoln said quite eloquently in his 1860 speech at Cooper Union, uh, you can't win that way. I've been saying for years that uh, you know, there are millions of Americans who basically don't consider uh, the liberal project legitimate. They consider it the opposite of what America means to them and uh, that they derive their identity uh, from questioning uh, the legitimacy and the ability of liberal government to, to function peacefully. So uh, I think that for a couple months, uh, even more, maybe six months, uh, Barack Obama's uh, charisma and his, uh, his remarkable popularity uh, kind of stunned some of these people into silence. I think people couldn't quite believe what they're saying. But if you, if, you, if, you, if you look at it historically, it's you know, quite continuous with what happened when Bill Clinton became president. You know, when you began to hear people you know, uh, accusing him of uh, you know, murdering his aides.
you know, when you began to have uh, people uh, saying that he was actually a, you know, agent for uh, the Soviet Union, which he had visited when he was a child, or when he was a teenager, or when he was in college. And you saw the th same thing when uh, Jimmy Carter became president, and, uh, you know, um, he was immediately considered uh, part of this uh, corrupt Democratic Party establishment. Uh, it happened every time a Democrat was elected, and it will happen every time a Democrat is elected. It's, it's, it's part of our patrimony as Americans. And the challenge for uh, a Barack Obama or any Democrat or any liberal is to understand that this is just part of who we are as Americans, to acknowledge it, to respect it, and to transcend it. And, uh, you know, uh, the lion can lay down with the lamb, but it's not going to last for very long. Well, tactically, the, the threat that, uh, by conservatives, by social conservatives, by the conservative movement, as they call themselves, based in Washington, based in, you know, uh, places like Northern Virginia, uh, to form a new party has always been this kind of bluff designed to, uh, you know, bend the Republican Party to their will. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's usually worked because the media reports it seriously, except for in the American context, you know, third parties very rarely work. We have a winner-take-all system. So, you know, the minute, say, Richard Vigory, who threatens to create a third party, you know, every four or eight years because he claims that the conservatives in power aren't really conservative, if he really did it, he'd Im immediately be, you know, surrendering all his uh, influence in national discussions. So that's not really a serious threat. Um, the division between, um, let's say, uh, corporate conservatives and religious conservatives is, you know, fascinating, interesting, rich, and complex. I mean, one of the ways it worked was that traditionally, uh, not traditionally, basically one of the ways it evolved in the 1970s was that people who wanted, uh, business who wanted uh, more laissez-faire, less regulation, uh, more control over government, more of, say, a cronyist stake in what government was actually doing, um, saw things like the Heritage Foundation, the Christian Coalition, the Moral Majority, as uh, opportunities for them to form a coalition, um, if you give it a generous interpretation, or aggrandize their power, if you give it a little more cynical interpretation. So you get these fascinating movements, like um, this uh, war in West Virginia in 1974 by religious conservatives to, uh, to kick uh, heathen textbooks out of the schools that were sort of supposedly imposed by religious bureaucrats. It was a very local issue. It was a very localized struggle. It had a lot to do with the way politics works in West Virginia, where you have this kind of history of insurgent violence from you know, coal miners. Um, and you get these uh, conservative, business conservatives in Washington at the Heritage Foundation realizing that this is an organizing opportunity for them. The Heritage Foundation sends representatives down to West Virginia and helps put these people in touch with national ideological entrepreneurs, with people like Richard Vigory. And that's how a coalition forms that basically uh, creates foot soldiers for uh, an agenda that the West Virginia religious conservatives may or may not be supporting, but eventually they'll come to support. Um, and uh, it's, there's, there's, there's both uh, an inherent tension and instability in it, but there's also within American Protestantism a real strain of pro-capitalism and individualism. So it's, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting, it's rich, it's tense. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. It's, and right now we're, you know, at a real knife's edge about whether it's going to work or whether it's going to fall apart. The CEO of, uh, say, an aerospace corporation might not want to have anything to do with uh, demonic possession, you know, uh, in Pentecostal churches. Um, but, you know, he needs the people who have those great passions in order to kind of anchor the conservative coalition. So the question is, when have they created uh, a Frankenstein monster? When have they created something that uh, they can't control? You're seeing more and more uh, indications uh, by, from conservatives of, you know, that kind of embarrassment. You know, I was out the other night, and uh, a West Point grad, a banker friend, uh, who's a conservative, he called himself the country club conservative, and said, I have nothing to do with those Sarah Palin people. Well, the problem is without those Sarah Palin people, the Republicans would never win an election. 
So, you know, they find themselves on the horns of a dilemma. And uh, the ideological entrepreneurs on the religious right who, you know, uh, let's face it, have an interest in aggrandizing their power and their control uh, don't really have any incentive to, um, to modify or moderate their positions. In fact, they're more likely to aggrandize their power and their influence by, uh, by maintaining a front of purity. So, you know, that, that, that speaks to the whole uh, tension and paradox behind the conservative project right now. All the people who've ascended to positions of power and leadership, and Rush Limbaugh is a perfect example, even though he pretty much unites the, you know, religious and the business conservatives pretty seamlessly, um, have achieved their influence, have achieved their power through a certain kind of cultural style based on their willingness to say that compromise is inherently bad. And that gets back to the question of whether Obama can you know, negotiate with people, the 20 million people who listen to Rush Limbaugh every day and consider any compri- compromise a betrayal of uh, America's promise itself. Right? So there's no incentive for a Rush Limbaugh to change because this is what's given him this, you know, these 20 million listeners, you know, his, his mansion that has a, you know, a replica of the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. So when um, you know, uh, the Republican National Committee or uh, a train of uh, conservative Republicans who wish to moderate the image of their party to make it seem more centrist and palatable to swing voters, try and do that, Rush Limbaugh is able to not merely uh, survive but thrive by uh, disdaining them. Healthcare is a fascinating uh, example of this question of how religious conservatives and business conservatives can act in coalition. You know, I'm be, on the, being on the, uh, the, the, the mailing list of, uh, you know, the American Family Association, Don Wildman's organization. I'm beginning to, you know, get the emails saying that, you know, health care, uh, that, that, you know, basically a national health care program is imposition on Christians. You know, it's going to uh, fund abortions. It's going to uh, uh, violate the sanctity of the traditional family. So you see a pure example of kind of a right-wing libertarian business conservatives uh, using uh, uh, the leaders of the religious right in a quite an effective way uh, to, you know, undermine uh, a mass constituency for a f- reform, which in the end is actually quite conservative. I mean, what could be more, you know, uh, what could be more judicious than, you know, like I said, uh, letting people change their jobs uh, if they have an entrepreneurial idea? What could be more strengthening of the traditional bonds of family and society than families not going bankrupt uh, because someone in the family gets sick? Um, but, um, you know, there are very powerful interests uh, who, uh, you know, basically benefit from the status quo. And they're able to take advantage of this pre-existing uh, di- distrust uh, that's, you know, very American of anything having to do with an expanding state. And again, historically, it's the same thing you saw with Social Security. It's the same thing you saw with Medicare. It's the same thing you saw with uh, the idea that the United States in the 19th century should have a central bank. You know, the same thing you saw when the government began talking about financing internal improvements like canals. Uh, the interstates, you know, which were seen as a communist plot by some people. Uh, so um, the challenge for progressives, the challenge for people who believe that this is uh, not only uh, an, uh, uh, an important goal, but an imperative goal, national health care, is uh, not to imagine that this kind of irrational fear is going to go away, but simply to bolt through it force health care down people's throats, whether they, whether they like it or not, and watch what happens 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now when, again, conservatives come to power promising to, uh, to uphold the ideals of uh, Obama's health care program, just like George Bush promised to uphold Social Security and promised to honor FDR, and uh, just like uh, 
conservatives of any gener every generation, or I should say reactionaries of any every generation, say, well, the liberals that we're dealing with now are unacceptable extremists. Uh, the ones we had in the last generation weren't so bad. I don't see it over the horizon, and Reagan is a perfect example of someone who simultaneously, you know, kind of honored the the impulses of this grassroots right, but also kind of massaged them, and also treated them like a politician treats a member of its coalition, like you know Franklin Roosevelt treated the unions, or Lyndon Johnson, you know, treated the the civil rights movement, the consumer rights movement. Ronald Reagan was able to basically massage the concerns of the pro-life movement without ever giving a speech to them, without ever granting them any uh, major policy concessions, while able to, you know, being able to um, place uh, their acolytes in positions of relative powerless, powerlessness, symbolic positions, you know, things like uh, smaller ambassadorships, you know, independent government commissions, and uh, with his charisma and skill, he was able to uh, mitigate the kinds of tensions that created. And there were tensions. You know, early in the 80s, George Will was one. Richard Vigory was another. There were a lot of conservatives saying that Ronald Reagan is betraying conservatism, which tend to happen whenever a conservative president is politically unsuccessful. You know, conservatism never fails. It has only failed. They'll say that a Ronald Reagan or a George Bush it fails because they're not conservative. And that sentiment lasts for as long as they're politically unsuccessful. But George Bush, it's, you know, every other day you hear a conservative say, well, the reason he failed was he wasn't conservative enough. Well, the problem with that is uh, George W. Bush brought to Washington uh, alongside a, uh, for most of his term, uh, majority conservative Congress and quite conservative judiciary, an entire movement entire set of institutions, an entire bureaucracy that conservatives have built up, you know, in the years since Barry Goldwater. So uh, when George Bush is president, he is not just uh, acting independently, but he's acting for the figurehead for, you know, an enormous movement that uh, was able to insinuate itself uh, up and down the bureaucracy and up and down the political chain. So that's where the blame has to lie, not with George Bush. Those kinds of people only come across once in a generation and you can't pick them out of a catalog. Uh, and they can kind of tend to come from surprising places. You know, certainly in you know, 1962, when Ronald Reagan was you know, a swashed up actor going around from GE plant to GE plant giving patriotic speeches, no one saw that it was him. You know, I don't see who it is. But if I saw who it was, then you know, I'd be a, you know, a, a genius political consultant, or I'd be a great leader myself. I mean, uh, leaders see things uh, in the public will that are often invisible to the rest of us mere mortals. There will always be an American conservatism. It's completely continuous you know, throughout our history. It has its own shifts and changes and evolutions, and some positions you know, that it held in the past, it doesn't hold now, and some positions it holds Hold, you know, it holds now, it didn't hold in the past. You know, for example, you know, the conser if you were a conservative in the 1930s, you were known as someone who you know, didn't believe in foreign military intervention. Right? You were fighting against the idea that America should rearm for World War II. Now, of course, uh, you know, conservatives are the people who are most likely to you know, call for a huge defense establishment and be more eager to kind of go on overseas adventures. But something having to do with individualism, having to do with sort of this fetishization of the nuclear family and traditional values, uh, having to do with uh, the belief that a businessman's republic kind of run uh, by and for businessmen whose uh, benevolence kind of trickles down to ordinary people. Uh, that's always been a part of American political culture and it always will be. I mean, the challenge for pro progressives is just to you know, put together a coalition to make sure that, um, you know, the conservative coalition uh, doesn't have enough power to, to I would say, uh, push through their agenda, but it's often the case that, you know, they don't have an agenda. I mean, there really is no conservative theory of government, as we saw, you know, for especially the first six years of the Bush administration, in which, you know, basically had, you know, a conservative hammerlock on uh, the forces of the state, and all they were able to really do was uh, weaken, you know, the state weaken our ability to collectively, you know, solve our problems together.
Well, among conservatives, uh, saying you're libertarian has always been a way to say, uh, I believe in everything uh, having to do with conservatism except the embarrassing stuff. You know, except the stuff, uh, it's ex except the, you know, the spiritual warfare casting out demons from certain zip codes, which was you know, a big part of Ted Haggard's you know, paradigm and the, church, the, the Pentecostal church that uh, Sarah Palin is involved with. Um, so it's always been uh, more of a, a gesture than anything else. Of course, the people who call themselves libertarians within the Republican Party, at least, have been quite willing to you know, go along with you know, these kind of violations of civil liberties that have kind of gone along with the war of terrorism. Although there are you know, genuine libertarians on the right who have been actually quite heroic you know, at uh, preserving the principles of civil liberties. Um, you know, on, uh, among Democrats, among liberals who... Uh, find themselves uh, uh, enraptured by the concepts of libertarianism, um, it's not as good a fit. I mean, some, some folks have been talking now about liberal-tarianism, which is uh, the idea that liberalism can uh, be stripped of its kind of paternalistic elements and uh, respect the autonomy of people better. Well, the problem with that is that's always been you know, the ideal of liberalism. Uh, and liberalism at its best, and the Democratic Party in its most mature form, has uh, always, uh, you know, attempted to uh, create the maximum amount of equality alongside the maximum amount of freedom. Now, it's it's something that's often honored only in the breach because that's the hardest thing for human societies to be able to accomplish. But you know, I mean, the the liberal vision you know, dovetails with, you know, what's called in the rest of the world social democracy, which is that you can't really enjoy anything uh, like liberty unless you have some minimum standard of living. You know, unless you're free to change jobs uh, if you hate your boss and you're not afraid of uh, losing your health insurance. You know, that's neither paternalistic, you know, uh, nor is it uh, socialistic, it's entrepreneurial. Right, so that's you know that's that's you know straight down the center of liberalism, and um, that's something uh, a libertarian would reject because it involves uh, expanding the role for the state. But a liberal, at its best, understands that sometimes expanding the state can actually enhance liberty in pretty profound ways. Mm -hmm.